Hey everyone, I'm going to do something new today. Now this is going to be a video about lathe tooling, but it's not a tutorial about, you know, how to use these things. There's heaps of videos about that on YouTube, so just check some of those out. They're made by people who know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, this is really just an adventure I had into purchasing new inserts for this particular tool. I have this um, set of carbon insert tooling that I purchased with the lathe. It was cheap. I didn't know what I was buying. I actually made a pretty good choice. I like that. I use it all the time. In fact, all the videos I've put on YouTube, I think I use that. I did purchase steel blanks as well, and I cut some myself because people say you got to learn how to do that. And so I did that. I'm not very good at it, and the results haven't been very good. I put that down to experience because I come down to the workshop and I use this one and I get a good result. It's always the same, been very happy with that. But I've been breaking some of the tips recently and so I wanted to get some replacements. I didn't just want to get the exact same ones again. I wanted to get other varieties that would fit into this tool. And I haven't got a corner shop where I can go and just ask the guy at the counter, hey, give me some inserts for this. I have to figure it all out and then go buy these things from catalogs online. And so I did that. I knew there was this coding system here. And so I took a dive into that and I figured out the minimum I need to know to do this. Buy replacements, buy more varieties of replacements. And I'm going to show you that. But there's more to it, because once I got them, I needed to know, well, what's actually the difference between them? And that's not all in that code. There's actually another whole set of codes, which are, I guess I'll call it the manufacturer's codes. And that's a much bigger topic. But I took a dive into that as well, because I really wanted to see, well, what is the difference between these? There were some fine differences in numbers, and I wanted to figure out what those were. And I'm going to show you that, because it'll help narrow the topic down to something understandable. Okay, so once you got these um, inserts, of course, you want to figure out what are they like? You know, do they give me different finishes? You know, is that what they're for? Can I get better depths of cut? Or, you know, what's it all about? So I wanted to make some cuts. And I did that here on steel and aluminium. But before I did that, I thought I should do this video justice and get into yet another topic that I've been avoiding all year. And that's feeds and speeds for this lathe and this material and these tips and all that. I've always been using what I call feels and speeds. I come up to it and I turn it on and I turn this little knob and I go, oh, that feels about right. I think probably most people who use these mini lays do that as well. But for the sake of the video, I got stuck into that. I think I can relay to you guys just enough so that you know you're in the ballpark with your feeds and speeds. And then afterwards, we're gonna look at these two, we'll look at the different finishes, and we're gonna compare it to the steel tool the results were very interesting with that. So if you want to see any of this, just stick around and watch the video. All right, moving right along. So our first topic here is the standard coding system and then also the manufacturer's coding system. If you have the insert code for your insert, great. I didn't have it because it didn't come on the box. There's nothing stamped on the side. Uh, there's nothing on the product page. But when I went back to the supplier's website, it did actually have a code on a spare parts section where they were telling me these are for this set. And so I could get the code from that. Now armed with that code, I go along to Google, type it in, and what do I get? Well, I get that exact page, the same place where I bought them from and a couple of other results, but it's exactly that number. So I've got that code right there, TCMT110204HQ, blah, blah, blah. If I go there, the impression I get is that that's the only insert that's available for that tool. Is it, however? I don't know, and that's what I want to find out. So I needed to get stuck into this whole coding system. Now, if you look up carbide insert coding systems or something like that, you'll very often come to this page. Now, I have been to this page more than once in the past year or year and a half when I wanted to learn a little bit about this. This one comes up. I would normally get halfway down the page and then I'd throw in the towel and walk away. It's just too complicated. And that's because of this. It starts off well. It tells you that there's these codes and the letters mean things. And the first letter is for the shape. And you go, oh, mine's a T. Well, the shape T is a triangle. There it is, it's a triangle. 
we're halfway there. Okay, and then I can get through the next uh, three or four, well, three items here. I understand them. But then when I get down to the numbers here, size, it's telling me that the number, and I've got six numbers, 110204, six numbers. And this is telling me that this is either one or two digits, indicating the size of the inscribed circle for any insert that has an inscribed circle. The inscribed circle is this. Say you've got a triangle and you draw a circle in there, just touching the edges, that's your inscribed circle. And I assume they're talking about the diameter of that. And it's telling us that it's a one digit number if the number of eighths of an inch in that circle is a whole number. And then it's a two digit number carried to one decimal place so that you can just knock the decimal place off when it's not a whole number. Okay, I'm about to give up right there. I mean, you can't sit down, measure your little inserts or your tool and try and figure this out. It's just not possible. However, I kept going and I assumed at that point that this must be a two digit number, one, one. Get to the next one, thickness, and it's the same idea again. It's a one digit number, but now it's the number of sixteenths, not eighths of an inch. I had to assume that my O2 was that. The next one, I have O4, so another two digit number. Now here it's telling me if it's a radius, then we count the number of 1 64ths of an inch in that radius. And if it's not a radius, if it's just a flat uh, cutting tip, then it's two letters in the case of a facet. And so here it all just fell to pieces. I, couldn't, I just couldn't figure this out. So I'd always walk away at that point. Well, because I'm making this video, I really needed to figure this out. And the clue is up here. It's American National Standard, ANSI. Now, what he fails to mention is that there's also ISO. Now, if you walk away and look for ISO, you come across this page over at Little Machine Shop. And in here, he tells you there's ANSI and ISO. Great. He's got this chart here. It says ANSI. And in there, you've got four letters and three one-digit numbers. But further down, he's got ISO. And here we've got four letters and three two-digit numbers. We'll start with the first one. What we're trying to figure out is which numbers and letters do we have to keep and which can we ignore or vary. Now the first one we know is a triangle. T is a triangle. Good. We keep that. Second one is the clearance. C. Seven degrees clearance. I can see it's got a little bit of clearance. Looks like about seven. We're going to keep that because it has to fit my tool holder. Uh, M. That's the next one. That's the tolerance. Now that's not quite so simple. It's a letter that represents a set of tolerance sort of ranges that apply to the manufacturing of the insert. Now these are M for mic. Now I notice that uh, when I'm searching for all these things, I only ever see M and G. So we're keeping that the same. The last one here, the last letter is geometry or its features. And these little inserts here have it's T, so they have a cutting edge on top, not the bottom. There's a chip breaker on top. There's a hole in it. It's chamfered. Well, that's, that's these inserts. I can see that. So we're keeping T because obviously M and R are not going to fit. And now moving along to the numbers, the first one, 1-1, one, one, it's the length of the cutting edge. And with the triangle, it's from tip to tip. Now, obviously we're going to keep 11. We're not changing that because we can't. But I do note that when I measure them, about 10 and a half, that's not 11. I will have to assume that that's either, either that the tips are round, and if the tips went to a sharp point, it would be a lot closer to 11. But also maybe the M tolerance is allowing for that. Because I do note that if I look up the cutting edge here, D, 5 one hundredths to 15, so 0.15 millimeters. And over here, this value, M, which on the triangle is all the way to the top, 0.2 millimeters. That's quite a bit, a fifth of a millimeter, right? So adding all that up, yeah, I can see how you might not get to um, 11. But we're going to keep it exactly the same. That's the whole point. Uh, the next one, I'll try and move along quickly. I've got O2. It's the thickness. 
I don't even have to look at it because we're not changing it. So however that works doesn't matter. We're keeping 02. The next one, 08, it gives us the actual value without the decimal place. So 04 is 0.4 millimeters. Great. This number seems to be up for grabs because maybe we could have 02. Maybe we could have 08. We'll find out. So the outcome of learning this is that if we want to find other inserts that fit but have variations, we're going to keep four letters and the first two two-digit numbers and we're going to forget about the third. That's the lesson right there. So armed with that information, if we go to a site, um, this site actually has a TCMT insert page. I'm not endorsing any sites. This is just a local site that I've looked at many times and got lost in. Well, mine are TCMT. They've got a TCMT page. And if I type in TCMT1102, which is those numbers I want, I get this result. 110208, so there's an 08 at the end, another 08, an 04, an 04, so those two are the same as my original one. And down here we get a silver looking one, 1104, but it's different. And then we get completely different stuff. 16T or other stuff that's just all wrong. And so I already know, because we're a lot smarter now, that those are not going to fit. And I know that these are going to fit, these five. But they're looking very similar. And so I needed to go the extra step. And this is where we get into the manufacturer's coding system. So the standard coding system has given us all the ones that will fit that tool. And the difference is in this number here, CA5525 and CA5515, and over here we've got 525, and again 5515. What's the difference? Well, I had to do the deep dive into the manufacturer's coding, and so when I did that, I get to this PDF. This is from Kyocera, who makes these inserts that I'm looking at. Obviously, other manufacturers would have their own PDFs, and it's a huge PDF with tons of information about all of their inserts. And this is about grades. That number there, the CA5515 and such, that's the grade. And in this grade PDF, the very first chart here is a summary of the grades. There's very little we need to know. There's a lot of information here, but there's not much we need to know. Uh, across the top in the chart is steel, stainless, and cast iron. Down the side is cermet and coated carbide. Now, this was new to me, cermet. Well, I looked that up, and cermet is ceramic material or ceramic metal, I can't remember. I think it was ceramic material, but it's spelt with an E there. That's a ceramic insert, whereas this one here is a carbide insert. So carbide inserts are not carbide inserts. Some of them are ceramic inserts. Who knew? And if I look up those numbers off that web page, the CA5525, 5515, 525, and TN60. There's the TN60 right there. And down here, under the coated carbide, we've got CA525, CA5515, and 5525 right there. Well, this column is steel, and on the left of the column, they're better for finishing, and on the right, they're better for roughing. And these bars indicate, well, what is that particular insert good at? And we can see here that this TN60 insert is good at finishing. In fact, it's so good at finishing that it's bad at roughing. The bar stops right there at the end of the P10. If we go down to these other ones, we've got CA525. So this one starts, you know, it still goes pretty far left, but it goes a long way to the right, pretty much right across the middle of the chart. So we could say, well, that's such a good general purpose, all the way to a good finish and all the way down to pretty good roughing. The CA5525, it's basically the same little bit different at the back end. And the 5515, well, it extends up a little bit. In fact, it's very close to that. It's almost identical to the TN60 over here, and it goes much further right. So what we're learning from this chart is that we're not getting any of these other ones. They're just not available in this particular case. And so amongst what's available, all I'm seeing is that these carbide insert ones are all pretty much in the middle of this column, basically the same and that that TN60, it's way over for finishing, and all I need to know there, it's not for roughing. And I can sort of tell that because it's got a really sharp edge on it. 
It's much more not like a knife blade, this one. Feels quite different from the others, which always have that kind of blunt feeling. The other things in this manufacturer's information is down here in the insert grades, and it talks about Sermit. And there is a difference. I don't think the difference matters at this level. These are differences that matter to people who are creating a manufacturing process, and they need to know how many feet of cut they're going to get at what depth, at what speed of such and such a material because they're making a part and they need to price it out and all that sort of thing. It matters to them. It doesn't matter to us here. But I just want to point out that there's two main coatings, and one is called PVD and the other is called CVD. The difference is really that the PVD is physical vapor deposition. And it means that the coating is applied to the insert um, with some method that's just physical, like it splatters it on there. Um, the alternative is CVD, and those carbon inserts, these gold ones, they're CVD, they're chemical vapor de deposition. So they use a chemical process to put the coating on. Now why that matters is the ones that are PVD are tougher the actual substrate, the cermit, is stronger. So this has a tougher substrate, but the coating is not quite as well applied. These ones have a better coating that lasts longer, but the substrate is a little bit weaker because of that. So the outcome of this is simply that we know what the difference is between these three inserts that I got. And if I had also got some of those other gold ones, I could see what the difference was there. And really, it's not a lot. I would probably just buy the CA525, that one there. Goes from there to there. That's a lot of range. That's general purpose. And that tiny little bit for the TN60, well, we'll see from the results later whether that makes any difference. And then we'll know. Okay, nothing else we need to know about this. So I went back to my site here, armed with that information, and I didn't really care. I just bought three of one of these with the 0.8 millimeter radius. I bought three of one of these with the 0.4, and then I bought three of this one with the 0.4 because it was different, more for finishing, and we know that now. And uh, that's pretty much as far as we need to get into the whole coding systems, just those two levels. Okay, the next part of this video is feeds and speeds. Now this was, as I said, another topic that seemed a bit complicated and uh, I was just avoiding it and using my feels and speeds instead. What we're gonna do here, I'm gonna try and simplify this topic down to just the basics that you need to know. And that's limited by your lathe. For example, the infeed speed, you know, the speed at which the carriage can move across under power, as it has a minimum speed. And that speed is 0.11 millimeters. It says so on the front of the uh, box. 0.11 millimeters per revolution. So that's a limitation. And I can only change that upwards by changing the gearing. I can't make it any slower. So that's one thing we know. Now, the other part of this is the cutting speed of the material. Now, in the lathe's manual, it has a cutting speed table, and I raced into here way back at the start, thinking I'd find a chart of materials and RPMs. Well, I didn't. I found a chart of materials, and these numbers, like, you know, 100 to 150, uh, P40 would be 50 to, well, who knows? But we're a lot smarter now. You'll often see um, SFM, which is surface feet per minute. And so you might, if you're metric, you might need to convert that to uh, meters per minute. But here in the Optimum Manual, they've already got this. And so looking at this chart, we've got, let's say I'm going to cut this kind of steel. And which one of these am I using? Well, I know HSS is high speed steel, but we're using inserts. So we're something over here. I'm going, well, what do all these mean? Well, conveniently, P10, P20, P40... Those are here in this guide that we just looked at. See, at the top of this column, you got P10, P20, P30, and P40, with finishing being the P10 and roughing being the P40. So that's what they're getting at here. If you're doing finishing, use these meters per minute uh, values, and if you're doing roughing, use these. And the difference is it's faster for the finishing and slower for the roughing. Um, let's just get an average of this and say we're going to be working somewhere in the middle. I note that it's 50 to 150. Let's just use 100. I'm going to be cutting this piece of steel 
at 100. So how do we work out what RPM we need for that? And just on the page above in this manual, they've got the calculations. And the calculation for cutting speed, this is the RPM of the machine, is this. It's the speed in meters per minute times a thousand, which gives us millimeters, because we do everything in millimeters here. And so let's go to the calculator and we'll go a hundred meters per minute times a thousand to get millimeters, so another three zeros, so a hundred thousand. And then let's take our workpiece and let's say it's an inch in diameter, about 25 millimeters. And we all know that to get the circumference, you multiply the diameter by pi, so 25 by 3.14. Let's say, let's just pick 80. It's about that, 80 millimeters. So we're going to go 100,000 divided by 80 equals 1,250 RPM. Well, that's perfect because that just happens to be the top speed of my lathe in first gear. All right, so that's our turning speed for steel at 100 meters per minute. Now, what about the infeed? I'm going to skip that one here, the depth of cut. We'll go back to that in a moment. But the infeed, now that's the speed that the carriage moves across at. We already know that this is set to 0.11 because it says so on the front. And that's the slowest possible speed. And I always knew that you should have it slow in order that the cutting tip you know, which is rounded so that it overlaps the previous cut as it goes across and doesn't end up cutting like a, an Edison, what I call the cylinder recorder, where it cuts a spiral on a cylinder. You don't want that. You want the spirals to be so close that they even overlap to give you as smooth as possible a finish. They give you a value that it should be at, and they're saying that the infeed speed, which we know is 0.11, should not exceed half the corner radius. Well, we know the corner radius is 0.4 because that's what we purchased. We also purchased 0.8, but let's check 0.4. So it's saying that your infeed shouldn't be more than half of that, which is 0.2. Well, our infeed is 0.11. It's well below that. In fact, it's almost half that. So my infeed speed is actually perfect. It's very good for this. That's for roughing. But they also talk about planing, which means a fine finish. And in, their, in this case, they say the infeed speed should be at the most a third of the corner radius. A third of 0.4 is 0.133. This lathe does 0.11. Clearly this lathe is designed with all of this in mind. So that 0.11 minimum uh, infeed speed fits all of this perfectly. Now we'll go back here to the depth of cut. What they say here, is they don't talk about the quality, they talk about good chipping. I already knew that speeding up would give you better chips. And what they're saying here is, in order to achieve good chipping, the depth of cut divided by the infeed should result in a figure between 4 and 10. Let's just see if we can explain that. Let's say our infeed is 0 0.11, so our depth is between 4 and 10 times that. So our depth of cut can either be 0.44 or 1.1 millimeters. Usually I aim for about a quarter of a millimeter because I'm a novice and I'm just sort of taking it easy. And also I'm usually sneaking up to a, a value. And I understand that that's not what you should do. You should be so good and so precise that you hit your final dimension with a good deep cut for the best finish, apparently. And so I'm, I'm being a bit light. I can take it up to a half a millimeter to a full millimeter, and I'm fine. That's basically what it's designed to do. So that's all of the calculations we need, needed to know for the feeds and speeds. What I've found out now is that, well, for, you know, for the steel, about 1250, half millimeter cuts to a millimeter, keep the infeed speed what it is, never change it, and I'm good. That's the ballpark. I know I'm doing it right. Uh, if I wanted to switch to the high-speed steel, it's much slower. They say take the speed down to half even. And so I will just bear in mind that I might drop it to 600 if I'm doing steel. And when you get down to brass and aluminium, it's fast again, 100. So that's, you know, 
600 to 1250 RPM. So what we're finding out here is that the lathe is actually designed to produce these results with typical tooling, typical materials, and uh, typical speeds here. You're getting the right results. So there we go. That's the whole discussion around uh, feeds and speeds. Okay, now we can finally get on to the results. So if you've lasted that long, you're doing pretty well. So I took a rod here of um, steel. This is the free machining or free cutting steel. And uh, this is the outcome. So what we've got is on this end, this is the original insert, which is the 0.4 radius. That gave me that result right there. Now that's very typical of what I get. And in all honesty, when I look at other people who do these things, that's a typical kind of finish I see on their videos as well. I'm not talking about the pros, but just people working like me here. And I've always been quite happy with that. But I started this project to try and see if I can get something better. And so the next one here, this is the same insert, but with the 0.8 millimeter radius. Now I was hoping that this would give me a smoother finish. And it's about the same. And one thing I notice about these tools is that I get this kind of a smearing effect where you get the spiral and then you get this kind of transfer or a little bit of pickup. And I've tried different lubricants and so on, but it's always about the same. And interesting here, I get the same from both of those inserts. They basically look the same. Now, moving along over here, this one immediately looks smoother. You see how that looks even? And the difference is it doesn't have that sort of smearing. That's this one here, that finishing bit. It's still got the 0.4 uh, radius on the tip, but it's definitely a better cut. You get a nice clean spiral. It's visible all the way along. It's quite tight looking and it just hasn't got that smearing. So overall, it's much more even and nice looking. But the cut there in the middle that looks noticeably better than all of them, that's my old steel piece right here. What I did before I started this was I took this back to my aluminum oxide wheel and I gave it another tip. This time I put more of a cutaway there on the top. I gave it a nice smooth round edge there. And I finished it up with my little sharpening stone and I used that. And immediately the results were better than all of the others, noticeably so. Well, it's not a mirror finish by any measure, but it's just nicer. So I'm quite pleased with that. And it's funny that I went to all this trouble to find out that my old steel bit gives me the best result. How about that? Okay, let's have a look at the other one, the aluminium. Now I did the same cuts here. Uh, this has been dinged about quite a bit because it's been sitting around my desk and I keep playing with it. Um, same thing. We have the, this is the 0.4, CVD carbon insert, that's the 0.8 radius. And in this case, the 0.8 is actually visibly smoother than the 0.4. Both of these have that kind of sort of little smooth spots on them. And I think that's the equivalent of those, those transfer or, or smearing bits that I get on the steel. But in the case of the aluminium, it just flattens it out and makes it smooth, which is nice. I think those both look good. And I was pleased to see that the uh, 0.8 was slightly better. Certainly when I see it in my hands here, that's slightly better. So the finishing one, the TN60 insert, the uh, PVD, what do you call it, Sermit, gives me that finish. And it's exactly the same as the steel. It's a uh, tidier cut, hasn't got any of those smooth spots that this has. And overall, very nice. But in the middle, the steel, that is visibly better. I notice on screen, it's not easy to tell the difference between all of these because quite frankly, these are all within 20% of each other. See, if I called that 100%, I'd call that 80%, 90%. So they're not that different. And so the interesting thing there is that the aluminum, I get almost the same result no matter what tool I use. And with the steel, I do get noticeably different results. And in particular, that steel one there, you can see it is better. I'm not convinced these are the best finishes I can get. I could probably get something better as well if I keep working at it. But overall, I'm pleased that I've improved my uh, work here. And one of the lessons is keep your speeds up. These are all 
at 900 to 1250. As I was testing it, I actually ran the lathe at uh, 300, 600, 900, and 1200 when I did these cuts. And in all cases, the 900 and 1200 were the better cuts, both for the steel and the aluminium. Okay, did you make it to the end? I barely got here myself. Now, I hope you learned a little bit, as I did, about uh, carbide insert codes and manufacturer's codes, just to allow you to find not just replacements, but different varieties that will fit your tool and also figure out what they actually do. Also learned a bit about feeds and speeds, which has helped me a lot because now I've got more confidence to know what I'm doing is right. Now I know about my infeeds, I know about my RPM and the depth of cut, and I know I'm doing the right thing now. And uh, very surprising to find that the uh, best finish was achieved with my old steel tool. In fact, the first one I made. And I think in future I will use these carbide ones for chewing into the materials, just removing stuff, maybe switch to that steel for the final one. Or if I need to sneak up onto a dimension, um, I'll use this TIN60 one, that uh, finishing one. I quite like that. It's very nice. Okay, so if you like what you saw, give me a like, subscribe, tell me how I'm doing in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one. Okay, bye-bye.